My name is former First Lieutenant Nikki Robinson De La Cruz, known professionally and publicly as Nikki Marina. These are my accounts of my mistreatment, harassment, abuse, and stalking by Lee Bamba. I will refer to her throughout this video until the end as LB. As I cannot bring myself to keep typing that name out or to keep saying it, Actually, no, I will keep saying it. I currently suffer from PTSD from what she put me through, and seeing her name is a trigger for a panic attack. But I'll get through it. Some of these dates have some of these events have dates associated. Some are summaries of her general behavior towards me from 2016 to 2017. At a, after a certain point, I lost my will to keep up much documentation because my situation became hopeless. There may have been some details missed, so I'm doing my best to recall the core memories of this harassment. I have suffered memory, memory loss from my PTSD, not just memory loss of that year, but of previous years and years that would follow. If other agencies or outlets care to hear more, they can reach out to me. So please bear with me, I am doing the best I'm doing, the, my, I'm doing my best and I certify under penalty of perjury that the foregoing statement is true and correct to the best of my knowledge and belief. As a cadet and an officer, I had always been a high achiever. As a matter of fact, just to prove that I went to the Air Force Academy, here's my plaque slash diploma. You can see that my name is on there a degree in political science and a minor in Spanish, and here is my class ring. Since I know sometimes, unfortunately, women, particularly women of color, have to prove everything. At the Air Force Academy, I was the president of the Hispanic Heritage Club. I was the group one academics officer, helping cadets struggling with grades to get back on track. My best friend and I attended the Air Education and Training Command Summer Leadership Program in 2012 and returned to run the program in 2013. We were regarded as drill and ceremonies experts. I was a flight commander for boot camp my senior year and I led a flight of new cadets to graduation day. All the while, I acted and directed for the theater club and sang the national anthem for many high, visibil high visibility USAFA events. USAFA meaning Air Force Academy. <clears throat> as a brand new officer, I took on a lot of responsibility as a brand new lieutenant. I organized a wing-wide event for the entire base of 2,000 personnel at Grand Forks Air Force Base. I also sang the national anthem for many high-profile events. For these accomplishments, I received letters of appreciation from the base commander himself. For 10 months, I went on a special duty called Tops in Blue for Air Force Entertainment. My previous commander had put me up for it, learning that I could sing. I performed as a singer and dancer for my fellow troops around the world. I was also appointed staging director for the tour in charge of directing setup of a $2 million stage set. While in that role, I cut the, t I cut the set up and tear down time of this massive set by 100%. At the same time, I was also appointed as the mission support flight commander. I also wrote and edited a formal rules and regulations guidance document for the team. 2005 was the most rewarding year of my life, and I was ready to come back to my station of Grand Forks Air Force Base and kill it at my job as a contracting specialist. I did not know that 2016 to 2017 would become the worst year of my life. I tell you all these things so that you can know what kind of person I was before all of this happened. When I got back to Grand Forks Air Force Base, I knew a few things about my commander. She hated tops in blue. She disliked Air Force Academy graduates, and she was lesbian. The last detail is needed for context, not for discrimination of any kind. I returned from TIB, tops in blue, on January 21st, 2016. I went into work on Monday as was directed by my commander. Oddly, she instructed me not to apply to tech school, which I needed, to move up to my next certification as a contracting specialist. She placed me under a different program not related to my skill set, under a civilian work supervisor, whom I will refer to as Jay. 
that I would later find out was her girlfriend and possibly mistress, as I believe she was married at the time. She kept offering to go get coffee with me sometime. My commander, Bamba. I smiled it off, but never followed through. It felt strange and uneasy to me. I wanted to remain completely professional. She would bring it up about three to four times after that, and each time I tried to smile it off and just go back to work. I would be remiss if I did not say that I noticed that my treatment began getting worse after continuously brushing off these coffee invites. One day she came to my desk to immediately scrutinize my eyeliner. She said it was too thick and thus considered faddish. Um, I removed the wings of my eyeliner immediately. Later that day after gym, I returned to my desk to find a printout of the female makeup standards from the AFI 36-2903 on my keyboard. Jay oversaw getting signed off, me getting signed off on my core task for certification. I made a point to repeatedly ask for feedback from Jay to make sure I was meeting her objectives. Every response I received was positive. Jay, Jay would regularly seem passive aggressive and make jokes about me messing up a few letters and such. When those jokes began coming, I started asking for even more feedback. The answers remained the same. I revamped several processes in that section to get things more organized. I developed a checklist and training plan for myself because Jay did not do anything of the sort. I started asking others in my office to help me refresh on my contracting skills as I had been away for 10 months. Bamba became extremely angry and said I had no business asking for help. I was assigned projects to work with people on in the office. Sometimes I would volunteer to do a little more work on them because I was mostly because I was feeling uneasy about how Bamba viewed me. Bamba counseled me that I should have split the work more evenly and delegated better to avoid some people in the office walking over me. I started to wonder if maybe I was too eager to work and that maybe I should just slow down and take my time a little more. Bamba began calling me into her office to tell me that people were remarking on how I would go to the gym daily for a long time and then take lunch. Every day as I was able, I would spend 11 to 12.30 and then take, at the gym and then take my lunch at my desk as I returned to work, never socializing in between. By the way, many people did this in the office. She said that she did not have a problem with me working out, as I did, but just remarked that people talk amongst the office and that I would have to be aware of that. I would later learn that she was attempting to coerce members of the office to write letters complaining about my behavior. The only one that may have complied was Jay, her girlfriend. The others refused as she was telling them to write, what she was telling them to write about me was not true. I asked my coworkers for feedback. <clears throat> Since people were supposedly talking behind my back about my daily habits. Everyone said I was good or great. On July 7th, Bamba suddenly stated that she was extremely disappointed in me as a leader and took away the airmen I supervised. In a threatening tone, she told me that she had spoken to the JAG about me, legal. Um, she said that she had been having a coworker tell her that I was skipping training. I replied that the reasons I couldn't make it to these trainings were for medical appointments. I have scoliosis and muscle spasms, as well as tendonitis in one knee, and I needed to go to physical therapy. These were appointments that I had made ahead of time. All other meetings I was mandated to attend, I worked around. I tried to explain that we were merely trying to work around each other's schedules. When I calmly tried to explain this, she stopped me and told me that this was a one-way discussion. She asked me something to the effect of, do you have any questions? I asked if I was understanding correctly that I was not free to make physical therapy appointments. She immediately lashed out saying, don't you try that with me. Don't you go there. I assumed she thought I was trying to accuse her of not allowing me to make doctor's appointments and thus incriminate her. <sighs> I asked if Bamba reiterated that he had told her, I asked if LB reiterated that he had told her that I had dodged training with him. I replied that there were a few doctor's appointments and that I had thought we were doing well in training. She had called in that coworker that was supposedly ratting on me. He said that he was sorry and that he didn't mean to throw me under the bus. 
I told him that's what seems is what seems is happening. Bamba then interjected and said, um, no, it's not. She then sent him out apologizing to him for this awkward exchange and thanking him for his honesty. Keep in mind that S, as I'm referring to this coworker, was a tech sergeant at the tech sergeant at the time, a person whom I outranked. She complained about me seeking counsel from my senior NCOs for advice on my work. She mentioned that I complained to other people about how Lieutenant S, the other lieutenant in the office, gets to go to meetings on her behalf. And I do not. Something else that I have never said. For context, Lieutenant S was the only other officer in the office. He was a white male and I outranked him. I was the second highest ranking member of the unit under Bamba. It was well known throughout the office that she favored him above me and treated him almost as equal while continually continuing to treat me poorly. When she was away, she would leave him in charge of the unit. She would put him for up, up for awards and give him more responsibility, even though it was known that his work quality was poor. All the while, I was treated as a remedial case, as if I lacked the mental acuity to do the things that he did. I also suspect that he was being used to spy on my social media for, for her. The trend was becoming clear. She had a circle of individuals that she favored. <clears throat> they were submitted for awards, highly praised, even invited to her house. They were all white. Every woman of color in the unit was treated poorly, abused, stripped of responsibility, accused of untrue occurrences, and closely monitored. We suspect she used hidden recording devices and hidden cameras. Most of these women were my mentors, and they were not allowed to speak to me. There were whispers about, around the base about this trend. It was very noticed and very evident, and yet nothing was done on Grand Force Air Force Base about her. A few of those women left the Air Force early, as I eventually did, because of the mental harm she did to all of us. My work supervisor was a white male, but he was targeted as well. Anyone that was comparable or superior to her in experience and knowledge seemed to pose a threat to her. He experienced stress-related health issues due to her treatment of him, and it persisted after she was gone, as it did for all of us at some level. Anyone of color became a target. Anyone of any color became a target as well if they came to our aid. This is consistent with other victims of hers. Bamba says she was concerned that I lacked the mental fortitude to even know what questions to ask about my job. She threatened to write me a letter of counseling or an LOC, very career harmful for a commissioned officer, saying that she had been merciful to me by not giving me one yet. She said once again that I was defensive and threw others under the bus without hesitation and that I was not behaving like a proper officer. She forbade me to go to any extra meetings, not even staff meetings, at which all the leaders of the unit attended on a weekly basis. She remarked that I did not contribute much to staff meetings anyway. Understand that there are many people that I outranked that got to go to those meetings while I sat outside like a dog and just watched. <laughs> I was crying at this point because as in the last few meetings, I felt trapped. I left the meeting on those notes, wondering if, even with all the steps I'd taken to take care of her priorities, somehow I was just incapable of being a decent officer. I wrote down a few of these incidents, and the next morning I went to go see the chaplain. On July 8th, my intent of the meeting with the chaplain was to discern whether or not I was doing anything to deserve these interactions, and whether or not I should protect myself. At this point, I thought I was crazy and a dumb, bad person not deserving of my rank. We had a morning and an, afternoon se and an afternoon session. By the end of the day, it was counseled to me that I was not bringing this treatment upon myself. The chaplain told me that Bamba had already garnered a reputation of being unstable and inappropriate. He assured me that there was nothing wrong with me, but that I needed to protect myself. He told me to document every interaction I had with her from then on. I was to meet the chaplain again the next week. On July 15th, I met with the chaplain again and reviewed the draft documentation. He read it and further assured me that I was not doing anything to deserve this treatment. I asked several times as a, because I didn't want to overreact. <coughs> I said that I was gathering character reference letters from colleagues and Air Force Entertainment staff 
for whom I worked when I was touring with Tops and Bloom. It was counseled to me to gather this documentation with my previous performance reports and other formal written feedback into a package. This package would be my protection if she ever threatened an LOC ever again. I was then counseled to make an appointment with Equal Opportunity, or EO. I went to my work supervisor um, and asked if what I did was a huge mess up. I, uh, I made a mistake posting a solicitation online. He replied that it wasn't, that mistakes happen, and that he's encountered much worse. He mentioned that I'm still new and learning, and I informed him that the commander had made a comment about it and that I was certain to hear about it today. He said that if that he didn't see it as a mistake of that magnitude. I told him again that nevertheless, based on Bomba's treatment of me so far, even little mistakes would be a harsh cause for verbal counseling. Um, this is someone that would call me to her office to counsel me if I did not place a comma in the right place in an email. I left his office and went back to my desk. Soon after, I visited the Equal Opportunity Office. After explaining my situation, she said it sounded like toxic leadership. She asked if I wanted to consider mediation and conflict resolution services. I responded that I have tried to commonly talk to my side of the story with Bamba, but she is usually dismissive and angry when I do. I told EO that I did not feel comfortable with that idea and that I was actually terrified that she would find out that I was at EO. She offered to contact Bomba's supervisor, the mission support group commander, to help hash things out. I declined as I did not want things to get out of hand or blow things out of proportion. I did not want to start any drama. As a black woman, I always felt the pressure to not make everything about race, even though the trend was very obvious. She then consoled me and said there was no reason for me to work in a hostile work environment. I said that I would finish the documentation, seek the chaplain for one more session of counseling to set my heart at ease that this was the right thing to do, and that I would contact uh, Equal Opportunity when I was finally ready to see Bomba's supervisor. The session ended at three, around 3.40 in the afternoon, and I stated that I was afraid to go back to the office because I was afraid of her asking where I went. The EO rep suggested that maybe if I tell her that I went to EO, that maybe she would change her behavior if I said that. When I returned, the secretary told me to go see Bamba immediately. I went into her office after she finished two phone calls in front of me. <clears throat> she asked where I had been this afternoon. I told her that I took gym time and then I went to a counseling session. She asked if I had actually gone to the gym. I told her that I had. She was angry that on my Outlook calendar, I had put appointment on that time block and that she did not know where I was, that it was too vague. She then stated that as the commander, she has a right to know where everyone is at every point of the day. She told me that she was taking away my gym time, that I was not allowed to do anything else but contracting work in the office, and that I was only allowed to make medical appointments. She said that my conduct had been unbecoming of an officer and that I had not reciprocated her efforts to facilitate my, de my development. <clears throat> she said that she had talked to the JAG and Inspector General about me and that she had ensured that she was completely in the right. I sat there calmly and did my best not to show any emotion because I knew she, was, she would chastise me. <clears throat> she asked if I understood. I said, yes, ma'am. She asked if I had any questions. I said, no, ma'am. She said that the fact that I had no questions for her was alarming. I told her that I believed that I had already said everything that I could say in past meetings. Regarding any mistakes on the job I had made, she said that she had never heard so many excuses, me trying to defend myself from, against lies like people writing letters about me, since she was an airman. She then mentioned the mistake I made about posting the solicitation. She said that it was an airman mistake and said almost in jest that I'm a first lieutenant from the United States Air Force Academy. I told her that I had discussed the incident with my direct supervisor, resolved the issue, and that he had communicated to me that it was a simple mistake. She said that it was not a small mistake. She brought the flight chief in to interrogate her about every single mistake I had made from January 2016 to the present July 20, 2016. Bamba accused me of not completing an administrative task she had assigned me in February. I tried to reply that I had made many attempts to present the finished product to her over the past few months. She halted me and said that this was a one-way conversation. By this time, I was sobbing and violently shaking. She said that she just believed that I had a lack of desire and that she assigned me a book, a, a reading book about motivation because I lacked it. 
She then said that I had received complaints from Jay, her girlfriend, about my demeanor and my work ethic. I told her that I regularly asked for feedback from my work supervisors and they said nothing to me. And then I would hear rumors coming from Bamba and these verbal counselings. She accused me of complaining about her taskers, of making comments about how they weren't necessary and that they were ridiculous. These were clearly things I had heard other civilians saying and still crying, I tried to say that these were downright lies and that these were someone else's comments. And then Bamba asked if she needed to call security forces to control me, military police. I had not left the sofa since the session began. She said that, she, that I lunged at her and she asked the flight chief that was sitting in the room to corroborate the story. She said, did you see that? And the flight chief said, no, because I didn't jump across the desk at her. She told me just to sit there and not say a word. She said that they, she would call them, she would call the police and they would have me arrested just because she could. She said that no one would believe someone like me. I knew exactly what this meant. In previous conversations with me, about me, she inferred that I might be behind the curve because I was from the wrong side of the tracks. Knowing nothing about me except that I graduated from USAFA and that I was a woman of color. I thought it was an interesting and offensive assumption to make about me and my life. She said that she had spoken to higher up Air Force leadership about me and that he was aware. She threatened that he, could, her contact, could mess up my next assignment and send me somewhere not pleasant. Perhaps somewhere where I would be separated from my husband again. The moment she threatened to have me arrested, I tried to shrink myself as much as possible. Bamba had given me paperwork for, for wearing makeup, for my bubbly personality, Paperwork for my personality, for dereliction of duty. There was nothing I could do to protect myself. I stopped wearing makeup altogether. I abandoned personal hygiene for the most part because I had no desire for upkeep. I stopped talking, I stopped smiling, I stopped looking people in the eye. I wanted to not draw any attention to myself, but it did not work. She threatened to move my desk into her office so she could keep a better eye on me. She threatened to have the entire unit surround me and hurl insults at me, telling me why I was a bad officer. This included airmen that I outranked. Again, I was the second highest ranking member in the unit. She forbade people in the unit to talk to me. I was completely isolated. She called me in and accused me of spreading rumors about her, telling people that she was unhinged. I had never spoken to anyone about her besides my husband. As a matter of fact, I had not even told my friends because I was too embarrassed of this situation. After that, she began spreading rumors of insanity about me, leading my friend's commanders to urge them to isolate me and not associate with me. It didn't work. Many sessions like this occurred. I recently found out that she would dismiss me crying out of her office after threatening me and then she would pull aside a coworker to check on Nikki because I think she might hurt herself, suggesting that I was suicidal. <clears throat> that coworker stated that I was stable and stated that she refused to spy on me for her. This happened several times, apparently, suggesting that she was indeed trying to push me to either harm myself or lash out at her. I am well aware that I am an expressive Afro-Latin woman and that I had several stereotypes working against me. Stereo stereotypes that I believe she was counting on. I knew she was reaching for the opportunity to make me lash out so that I could dig my own grave. I resolved to never give her that chance and I stood my ground. Spoke softly, even through tears. Stood at attention or parade rest every time she called for me. And I gave her no justification to paint me as aggressive or dangerous to myself or others. And the calmer I remained, the worse she became. And the more she pushed the envelope. She began requiring me to log all my activity every hour on the hour and report it to her daily. She had me follow, telling me that it's a small base and it's a small town and I have eyes everywhere. She made sure to make me know that I was followed because whenever I got back from visiting the chaplain for spiritual guidance or from mental health, I'd started going because of all of this. She would greet me upon my return and tell me that she knew where I had been. 
I could not even go into town in peace. I did not know by what method she could possibly have me followed in Grand Forks, but I felt that she would find a way. I remember my mom calling me while I was shopping at Old Navy to check on the situation. I went to hide in a clothes rack before frankly speaking to her, just in case there was someone who had followed me into the store. I was terrified. She, did it. she disconnected my office chat, saying that it was a distraction from my work. I could not communicate with anyone. I used it to communicate with the chaplain to set up meetings without her knowledge since I had told them that she was having me follow. I knew she had my IM and email activity monitored so that she could know where I was. She restricted my movements on base and required me to report to one of her friends in the office every time I left the office area. One occasion led me to finally file a complaint. On another one of these debasing sessions, I believe October 12, 2016, I completely broke down, crying on the floor on my knees, in uniform, begging her to please stop. To that she laughed out loud. The superintendent, who was also present, one of her lackeys, joined in on the laughter. At that moment, for some reason, it finally clicked. She enjoyed this. This was entertainment for her. On that day, I went to file a complaint to the Inspector General. I also started going to therapy at the mental health clinic for the first time ever. I had put off this complaint for so long because I had no intentions when initiating this process to cause harm to anyone's career. I only desired to know if I indeed had committed acts that had warranted LOCs and how I could protect myself from a potentially toxic leader if the need were present. I only wanted to work diligently in any way that supported the unit daily and to feel confident enough to take on challenges and readjust the career field without the fear of making small mistakes or being pun potentially punished for actions that do not warrant punishment. I did not want to make accusations without first doing self-reflection on what I might be doing wrong, and I certainly did not want to jump the gun by instantly blaming my commander for any shortcomings. Therefore, it took a few months and two mentions of LOCs exp explicitly for her for me to come forward to anyone about the situation formally. Sometime after I filed that complaint, I was called into her boss's office, Colonel H. Actually, no, I'll say his name. Colonel Holliday. This man was known around base to have racist tendencies and to be friends with Bamba. He, with her presence, threatened to have me kicked out of the Air Force. He then dismissed me. Also, after I filed that complaint, she banned me from attending training for my next level of certification with the reasoning that I lacked the mental capacity for further learning and that it would be a waste of government money. I will point out that I eventually did go to that training but I believe it is because somebody forced her, someone higher up. She gave me orders not to engage with any other agency about what, with, about what went on between me and her in her office. This, by the way, is an illegal statement to make to a military member. She said I could not even tell my husband what was going on. She said if I wanted to tell anyone about what she was doing to me, I could talk to a lawyer. This did not surprise me much as military commanders have almost omnipotent power over their subordinates and can do whatever they want to them, if they were able to come up with a good enough reason. So she knew the bare bones boundaries of what she could say and do to me and be untouchable. I went to see the Airman Defense Council immediately afterwards. They pretty much said, whoa, that sucks, and then told me to go back to work. And I panicked, telling them that I could not possibly go back to work after she had just given me an illegal order not to report her treatment of me. During this period of my life, I was a zombie. She had taken all my responsibility as an officer and much of my workload away. She would pace back and forth by my desk, glaring at me. I tried my best to look down. If I entered her office, for which she had an open door policy, without knocking on the open door, she would scream at me and ask, how dare I think I could just approach her so casually? This was funny, as I had seen several white members of the squadron just pop into her office like buddies. Those of us of color seemed to not have that same privilege. Sometimes she would demand me to accomplish a task for her, a simple one maybe. And then when I had completed it, she would shoo me away like a dog or a slave, remarking, can't you do anything right? Or, well, what are you standing here for still? 
Every night I went to bed praying to God to take my life in my sleep because I could not bear to face another day. Every morning when I woke up, I screamed in terror that I was still alive. I screamed all the way to work in my car and I sobbed all the way back home. And then I would collapse on the couch, barely eating, barely interacting with my husband, only to start the cycle all over again. This became my norm. Sunday nights were especially bad, dreading to have to return to Bamba after a brief respite of two days. To this day, I still experience several severe panic attacks every Sunday night. This is the most I've said her name without having a panic attack. Probably because I'm pissed as hell. One day she said that she was going to have me psychologically evaluated because she believed I had a personality disorder or a mental problem and that we were going to get this fixed together. I endured a whole day of testing at the base medical facility. I wanted them to find something wrong. I wanted to know what made me so dumb, what made me bad. I wanted to know the reason. At the end of the day, I met with the head psychologist. 